All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled RNA Interference in Agriculture, Methods, Applications, and Governance. I'm Chris Boomsma, CEO here at the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology, also known as CAST. And it's my privilege to chat with you folks today for just a little while before I hand it off to our chairs and presenters and then our panelists. So let's get started on today's webinar. First of all, before we kick off on this topic, just a few quick facts about CAST itself. It is a membership-based nonprofit organization, a 501c3. It's formed in 1972 as a result of a 1970 National Academy of Sciences report. We are proudly, proudly nonpartisan, apolitical, unbiased, and science-based. We have a diverse array of members that are not only at the individual level, but also at the organizational level. You can see some facts about us right there. Scientific societies, universities, libraries, nonprofits, companies, and others. And we celebrated our 50th anniversary in 2022. CAST's mission is to convene and coordinate networks of experts to assemble, interpret, and communicate credible, unbiased, and science-based information to policymakers, the media, the private sector, and the public. A little bit about how we accomplish this mission. Well, we accomplish it through the use, through the uh, volunteer contributions of many individuals. We have 65 board members representing scientific societies, companies, nonprofits, and universities. Very diverse membership there. A lot of active task force members. We have folks that review papers, folks that write papers, folks that have given us help on presentations, as we'll see today. So it's a volunteer-driven organization that day-to-day -day is run by staff. We're very proud of the engagement we have from our volunteer community. Now, I want to thank a few sponsors before we get started with today's webinar. First of all, NC State College of Ag and Life Sciences, also Greenlight Biosciences, Syngenta, and BASF. The support that each of these organizations provided helped us roll out this paper in person at North Carolina State University, and now helps us bring this webinar to you today. So we're very, very grateful for each of these sponsors. Now, with that, I'm going to hand it over to today's presenters. First. Anna and then Ken. And so I'm going to invite both of them to come onto the screen at the appropriate time. And Anna, I'm going to hand it off to you first. And we look forward to today's presentation. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thank you, Chris. So as Chris says, I'll first introduce myself. I am Ana Maria Velez Arango, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I have been working in RNAi for the past uh, 10 years on different aspects from risk assessment to characterization of nutrients, resistance, and mode of action. And with that, I'll let my uh, co-chair introduce himself. Thank you, Anna. My name is Ken Narva. I'm the uh, head of entomology at Greenlight Biosciences. Uh, I started my career in ag biotech about 35 years ago. I'm working on a number of technologies along the way. And probably about in 2008, got into RNA interference uh, in the transgenic mode. And more recently at Greenlight Biosciences, we're working on sprayable applications of double strand RNA. Anna, back to you. Thank you, Ken. So before we start, I want to acknowledge all the authors that contributed to the paper. All of them consider experts on RNAi around the world. Those included uh, Molly Darlington, a PhD and postdoctoral research associate in my lab, Kerti Rathor, professor at Texas A&M University, Juan Luis Jurat Fuentes, professor at the University of Tennessee, Gies McGee, professor at uh, at the Department of Plants and Crops in Wendt University in Belgium. Karl Heinz Kogel, a professor at Justice Living University in Germany. And Steve Weyer, professor at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg in Canada. We also want to thank our cast liaison, Carl Mosley, and the reviewers of this manuscript. Next, please. So this, uh, paper and both the presentation are for mid-level stakeholders. So for those of you that have been working with RNAi, some things might seem too basic, but uh, we wanted to make it in a way that everybody can uh, understand. So what we're going to present today is just a little overview on what is RNAi and how it was discovered, the role of RNAi in agriculture, some applications, regulatory considerations, some of the products that are now available in the market, challenges, and future innovations. 
Next, please. So before we start talking about RNA, we always should start talking about the central dogma of molecular biology, where uh, in the nucleus we have DNA that is transcribed into messenger RNA. And I want you to notice here that this messenger RNA is single-stranded compared to that DNA that is in a double-strand shape. This will come relevant later in the presentation. This messenger RNA is then exported to the cytoplasm and transcribed into a protein. And remember that proteins is what it builds life, is what it makes all the functions in uh, organisms. Next, please. So how RNA was discovered was discovered in some way by mistake. There was researchers in the 90s in Caltech trying to transform petunias to overexpress an enzyme associated with purple uh, pigmentation. So what they thought they were doing is that they were including that messenger RNA coding for the purple protein to make those flowers more purple. Next, please. However, what they find out, and they were baffled by these results, they found some flowers that were white on and with some uh, patterns of white. The other researchers started finding similar results in fungi and the roundworm. Uh, next, please. They thought, again, that they were incorporating that messenger RNA. Next. And they later found that it was not this, and I'll explain that in a second. Next, please. So uh, in 1997, Andrew Fire and Craig Mello described the mechanism as RNA interference in the roundworm Cenorhabditis elegans, and this made them won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2006. Next, please. So what they describe is that this was actually a post-transcriptional gene silent mechanism. What this means is that instead of incorporating that purple a messenger RNA or like the messenger RNA that encoded for that purple protein, they realized that they were actually incorporating double strand RNA. And this in the cell works in a completely different way. So these double strand RNAs enter the cell, they are long between 240 base pairs. And what I mean by base pairs is those pairs of A and T's or C and G's. These ones are then chopped by an enzyme called DICER into small interference RNAs that are 21 to 24 base pairs. And one strand of these small interferences RNAs binds into the RNA-induced silencing complex or risk. This eventually, what it does is that binds to that targeted messenger RNA and actually destroys it. So instead of producing more of that, actually is destroying that messenger RNA that is already available in the cell, is degraded, and there is silencing, or what we call uh, it's not a, uh, the not production of that uh, protein. Next, please. So what is RNA interfering is that double strand RNA actually leads to messenger RNA degradation, and this prevents protein formation, and this is what we call gene silencing or gene knockdown. This mechanism is in that innate in uh, eukaryotes and is conserved, is used for gene regulation. So let's say that we have a lot of one enzyme, the organism produced double strand RNAs to uh, silence that um, messenger RNA, and is also used as a defense against viruses. Next, please. And as we move forward, I think it's important to clarify because it can be really confusing uh, with some concepts. So. RNA interference is the mechanism. Double strand RNA is the molecule that enters the cell or the molecule that we deliver. SIRNA or single strand RNAs, small interfering RNAs, excuse me, is the active molecule. This is that molecule that will help silence that um, messenger RNA. Then the gene silencing or the knockdown is the result that is basically the degradation of that messenger RNA and that we don't have that protein production. Next, please. So what is the role of RNA agriculture? There is multiple roles, but one of the biggest ones in the later years is the crop protections against insects, pests, and pathogens. This is being explored both as a transgenic, so expressed by the plant and an sprayable, and Ken will talk more about this later in the presentation. 
So basically what we do is that we knock down genes that are important for the organism to function with double strand RNA, and these generate lethal or sublethal effects that tends it protects the crop. Next, please. So what are the some of the advantages of using RNAi for crop protection? First is a new mode of action. This is particularly important for a lot of insects and fungi that have evolved resistance to other modes of action. And for uh, insecticides, the Insecticide Resistant Action Committee now characterize RNAi as group 35. The other advantage of RNAi is that it reduces the reliance on synthetic chemistries, it's a highly specific biopesticide, it has low environmental persistence and low residue on crops. Next, please. Some of the disadvantages, and I will expand more in the next two slides, is that there is variability in response between organisms. We initially thought that it would work well on all organisms. Later, we're finding that that's not the case. Another disadvantage is that it's, it's lower acting compared to synthetic chemistries, and it also has a narrow spectrum of uh, activity. This is both an advantage and a disadvantage. An advantage because we can target a specific pest and not affecting others, but at the same time, we're only targeting one or two species compared to synthetic pesticides that we can target multiple uh, pests at the same time. Next, please. So expanding on that variability in the response between different organisms. In insects, for example, we already know that there is variability between order, species, life stages, tissues, and genes. And we know that the um, order that is more susceptible and it works best is in coleoptera, so beetles. And Ken will be talking about two examples for uh, coleopterans. And then there is other species where the variability, uh, where the response to RNAi varies, including octoptera, diptera, hemiptera, and in lepidoptera is considered as recancitrant, so it doesn't work well. And that's one of the challenges that we have. Next. For fungi, it, we, it, our researchers realized that RNAi will work based on Crohn's Kingdom RNA, uh, where uh, we knew that the plant cell can transfer those uh, small RNAs into fungal cells. And one of the challenges that we have there is that we don't know if all fungi respond to Crohn's Kingdom RNA, and it's unclear if they can, all different species of fungi can uptake double strand RNA. So that's still in progress. Next, please. And this, I will hand it to Ken to continue. I'm talking about the applications. Thank you, Anna, for uh, getting everyone grounded on the basics of uh, how RNAi works mechanistically in organisms. Um, what I'm going to do is walk you all through a few examples of uh, early demonstrations of applications of RNAi for agriculture, and then uh, on to some real products that are now on the market or, or nearing sell. So what you see on the screen here is an example of corn rootworm resistance by transgenic RNAi uh, to di directed against Diabratica rugifera. Uh, this report was first, or, or this report was published rather in 2007 in Nature Biotech by the group out of Monsanto led by Jim Baum. Uh, when this became uh, known across the industry, it was really apparent that uh, RNAi does have a place in agriculture uh, at an industrial scale. And most uh, major agricultural companies uh, that were involved in corn started to pursue RNAi for, for corn rootworm. Next slide, Chris. Uh, extending on that, as, as Anna said, coleopterans are much more act, uh, active in their processing and susceptibility to double-stranded RNA uh, compared to other organisms. So one thought was, well, let's try this on Colorado potato beetle. And ultimately, you know, the journey from the laboratory demonstrations on uh, leaf discs and other small plants um, all the way to the early field stage was demonstrated. So here you have an example where sprayable RNA could be used uh, for control of a pest. Uh, one of the challenges with spraying RNA that it was known uh, from this example is the ability to produce large amounts of it that could be deployed at a field level. So that really slowed down the progression of uh, sprayable double-stranded RNA for some period of time. Next slide, Chris. 
more recently, there's been a, an upsurge of activity applying double-stranded RNA for uh, fungicidal purposes. Uh, shown here on the screen, one example with botrytis. And in this case, as Anna mentioned, there's much less known about mechanistically how fungi take up double-stranded RNA uh, into the cytoplasm, process it, and then uh, elaborate the RNAi effect. The researchers at uh, University of Queensland work on a, a substance called bioclay, which is a, a carrier molecule that actually mediates the uptake of, of double-stranded RNA uh, into fung fungal cells and uh, elicits a much stronger response compared to naked. The, panel on the, the panels on the right are a little hard to explain, but if you just look at the, the bottom right-hand six uh, pictures, you can see that there there's much less uh, fungal infection at the point of inoculation compared to uh, double-stranded RNA that's naked or, or the controls. So this technology actually works quite well and is really a first example of uh, the foray of RNAi into uh, fungicides. Next slide, Chris. Uh, somewhat of a, a special example that I wanted to bring out because it's been uh, worked on for quite some time now is the control of varroa mites uh, in honeybee colonies with double-stranded RNA. Uh, there are a couple examples of mites being susceptible to contact um, delivery of RNA. And, and this is one actually, this concept is one that's in Greenlight's pipeline. When supplied in a sugar pouch solution uh, showed on the, on the left, uh, the nurse bees take that up, take it back to the hive, and then feed the uh, developing larvae. Um, the varroa mites, which are present in the, the brood food and the combs, ultimately come into contact with the, that double-stranded RNA. And over, over uh, a period of time, you get a large population reduction of the mites and a much greater hive health. So this is a, a, a concept that I think we'll see commercialization uh, in the next couple of years. Next slide, Chris. So extending beyond um, uh, insects and arthropod management, uh, one can think of using double-stranded RNA to um, influence metabolic pathways within, within crops. And indeed, transgenic example, there's examples of this in potato or cotton are published on. Uh, in the case of potato, the reduction of glycoalkaloids um, imparts some pest resistance and with gossip, Paul reduction, one that can enable the production of reduced gossipol um, cottonseed, which is amenable as a as a animal food feedstuff. Um, gossipol on its own is is uh, not palatable to to animals. Next slide, Chris. So with with these sorts of applications in mind, um, one has to ask then how how will this technology be regulated? And in the case of the transgenic, what we call plant incorporated pesticides or PIPs, uh, there's a coordinated uh, framework for regulatory oversight involving the EPA, the FDA, and USDA. EPA deals with human health and environmental safety of RNA products, the FDA with uh, the safety of foods that may come in contact or produce uh, double stranded RNA, and USDA deals with risks to agriculture in terms of weediness of. Um, transgenics. In the case of sprayable RNAs, it's largely um, the EPA that regulates those as a, as a sprayable pesticide. Next slide, Chris. So when thinking about regulation of, of sprayable RNAs or, or PIPs, um, the start is to think about the composition of the product because it's ultimately the, the end use product and how the product is used that frames up the questions that are used in risk assessment. And so, um, and you'll see this column for both PIPs and sprayables in a minute, but the RNA molecule uh, is sequence specific, specific. So the way we like to think of it at Greenlight is with its specificity by design. That means that we choose sequences that are specific to the targeted organism and don't have an off-target effect on humans or um, or non-target organisms. The other aspect of RNA is how long does it persist in the environment? Uh, generally, naked RNA degrades very quickly uh, in less than a couple of days, so the degradation profile and bioaccumulation is very low. With plant-incorporated pesticides, they're expressed in the crop, so the method of manufacture and use is really 
um, developing and planting crops and, and uh, using that as a incorporated uh, pest resistance technology. So the, the formulation design, as we call it, is the plant matrix. That's where you would find the RNA. And again, expressed in the crop to uh, elaborate insect resistance. Next slide, Chris. A little bit different when you think about sprayable RNA, the same sequence specificity aspects uh, exist, meaning design for specificity. The methods of manufacture, formulation, and, and use become quite different, though. Um, in the case of uh, sprayable RNAs, uh, we're looking at methods that use cell-free enzymatic biosynthesis in a reactor, or it might be expressed in a uh, genetically modified microbial system, such as E. coli or a yeast. Uh, formulations uh, take, take shape in either liquids or dry formulations, and that will depend on the ultimate end, end use. Uh, the application methods might be sprays. It might be some other um, method of application like we saw with the bee example. Uh, in terms of a bait. And the product use, use usually in the case of sprayable RNAs are a tank mix. And this is important to consider because when you mix a sprayable RNA uh, with tanks, tank mix partners, you need to make sure that you haven't changed uh, the persistence or biodegradation of uh, the RNA. Next slide, Chris. So remember when, when one considers a risk assessment for um, a substance, a pesticide, it's a combination or a factorial of um, hazards and exposures. And so if you think about hazards for an RNA product, on the human health side, again, you have the, the consideration of the bioinformatic analyses, which looks at sequence specificity and any off-target or uh, minor mismatch um, sequences. And this is usually done at the level of the 21 mer, which Anna mentions is siRNA, so those small bits that are made from the long double-stranded RNA that are actually the effectors or targeters of Argonaut. Uh, that's what the, the analysis takes into consideration. Informatics can give you an idea of, of what the hazard might be, but it's not uh, predictive in itself. And so then the tier toxicity testing comes into play with a number of different um, tox tests of the material of interest. In the case of human health, you also have the possibility of non-sequence specific effects that may elicit an immune response. And so there again, uh, when a product is formulated and, and, and sprayed, you may have a situation where that formulation uh, has to be examined for its uh, immunogen immunogenicity. Environmental safety, much of the same considerations at the sequence level in bioinformatics analysis. Um, here, you're really looking at tear toxicity tests against um, non-target organisms that might be present in the, the crop of interest. Next slide, Chris. Okay, remember, risk is hazard and exposure. Um, exposure, when you think of human health, both sprayables and plant-incorporated pesticides uh, could be present in uh, the diet, um, either through transgenically expressed RNA or through RNA that's applied to a food stuff. It's worth, worth noting that humans have a very strong digestive barrier uh, that will quickly break down and make a double-stranded RNA. Uh, this will obviously have to be looked at in a different light if, if the formulation imparts um, significant stability. And then in terms of exposure, uh, worker exposure with sprayable pesticides is, uh, brings on additional considerations. Uh, not only do you have the ingestion through dietary sources, but you've got inhalation, thermal contact, or ocular considerations to uh, take into account. Environmental safety, again, NTO exposure. Uh, what is the potential for a non-target organism to be present in the crop of interest that's being treated with, with uh, the spray or the PIP? And then also, as, as Anna mentioned, what is the susceptibility of the insect to that double-stranded RNA? Some organisms like a Lepidoptera are very recalcitrant um, or not that susceptible to double strand RNA when simply ingested into their, their, their gut system. Next slide, Chris. <clears throat> so now just a, a few quick examples of uh, the kinds of products that have been produced with um, RNAi technology. Uh, the first of which is 
honey sweet plum, uh, which is resistant to plum pox virus. Uh, this product came about um, through some research of a USDA lab that was looking almost uh, similar to what Anna described, where they were going to overexpress a coat protein and hope to confer some resistance. What they found was they didn't overexpress the coat pro protein, but still got resistance. And when they looked closer at this, they found that their um, genetic construct had rearranged in a way that it created a double-stranded RNA intermediate that was then uh, ultimately spliced into siRNAs that uh, can confer the, the virus resistance. So a, a really interesting uh, application, not intended, not engineered that way, but it, uh, ultimately the genetics turned out to be RNAi. And this product was registered by the EPA um, all the way back in 2011. Next slide, Chris. So here's an example that we're probably, uh, many of us are very familiar with and and, and actually really, really quite passionate about, and that's the use of RNA uh, for root worm control in transgenic corn. And Monsanto, uh, now Bayer, developed uh, DVSNF7 as a double-stranded RNA as a new mode of action to partner with the BT crystal proteins, CRI3B and CRI3435 that were pro uh, present in the product. Now, this is really important because there were emerging um, accounts of resistance to both of the BT proteins in the field, so there was field of fall problems, uh, situations of crop uh, damage, and adding in a new mode of action like RNA uh, will provide durability for this technology overall. Uh, EPA registered uh, SmartStax Pro back in uh, 2017, and uh, commercial release was in 2022 after various country or um, country registrations were were obtained. So a real success story uh, at a global. Um, wide acre scale. Next slide, Chris. So something I'm uh, really proud to, to talk about here on this slide is uh, the first sprayable biopesticide, double-stranded RNA biopesticide, was registered at the end of last year, December 22nd, um, by the EPA. And so now we have national uh, U.S. registration and state registrations are following. So we are, are in a position now uh, to be able to, to market Calantha, as it's called, for um, uh, treatment of Colorado potato beetle. So some of that, the slides we saw earlier about crop protection has now become a reality at uh, full-scale uh, production through this um, double-stranded RNA product. Next slide, Chris. So with those as examples of um, successes, really uh, the plum pox virus and there are a couple other virus resistance as well. The smart stacks and other, as I mentioned, other double strand RNA for rootworm in product pipelines. And now um, a sprayable example, one can see that uh, sort of the stage is set for this technology to be utilized even more broadly. But it's not completely straightforward as Anna indicated. Um, various pests have uh, varying susceptibility to double stranded RNA. And so we call those recalcitrant pests and pathogens. Uh, there is a need for RNA delivery, like the bioclay example. So a, I think a large amount of innovation will um, be put into the use of carrier molecules that are agriculturally approved and, and uh, relatively safe on their own in partnering with the RNA for delivery. There will be the challenge of resistance. Uh, so far, there have been there's one, one case of a field evolved resistance isolated by the, the group of Monsanto and characterized for double stranded uh, RNA from corn rootworm. And uh, one of the researchers, who's uh, Juan Luis Gerard Fuentes, has selected in the laboratory uh, Colorado potato beetle resistant to double stranded RNA. So mechanisms do, do exist, and we'll need to consider how to protect the durability of these products. Uh, the last challenge, of course, is time and cost to develop. The uh, transgenics take um, you know, well over 10 years to, to uh, move through the de development phases and regulatory phase. And uh, although the sprayable pesticides or RNA pesticides are a bit faster to develop, the, the regulatory considerations are still there and, and take time to uh, uh, move through the regulatory process. And on that note, I would mention that the EPA uh, has been a very rigorous uh, partner in the registration of uh, the sprayable example for corn rootworm, and we really value their inputs and their 
their guidance because uh, they, they do such a great job that it, it acts to serve as an example across other com countries that are looking at this technology. And the last challenge, of course, is public perception. As Anna presented it, it appears to those of us that are scientists a relatively simple uh, extension of what we call the central dogma. Uh, however, that is not a concept that's well known amongst uh, you know various public stakeholder groups, and it really does take an intentional outreach of education to help um, simplify the message on how this technology works. Next slide, Chris. So what's what's up uh, next in terms of possibilities for, for RNA, INA? On the transgenic side, one can imagine that for sure uh, the large acre, acre crops will get uh, consideration in the future, uh, different applications, um, be it for pest control or, or um, engineered crop traits. And there are new ways to deploy this uh, these double-stranded RNAs in crops. Uh, good examples recently for expressing double-stranded RNA in chloroplasts uh, to extend the durability or, or uh, existence, persistence of the RNA uh, within the plant cell so it can reach its intended target. And then more recently also, uh, the use of artificial microRNAs, which are those long uh, hairpin structures you see, probably too small to see, but just imagine those green siRNAs embedded in these large structures have uh, different processing properties, and so one can engineer uh, the differential expression or processing of these of these uh, artificial microRNAs for the intended outcome. As I mentioned previously, new sprayable formats uh, based on carriers, and there's a large amount of research going into cationic polymers of all sorts, uh, starting with ones that are uh, found in nature, like chitosan, uh, so the uh, positively charged cationic polymers will bind to the negative charge of the RNA and, and uh, provide a, an ionic complex that is uh, more resistant to degradation or maybe more amenable up to uptake. You know, similar concepts uh, when encapsulating in lipids or, or peptide carriers. Next slide, Chris. Uh, so last, you know, I think you can see from the, uh, the examples of, of what's been done so far and you can imagine what might be done in the future. And the uh, diagram on the left shows just a whole array of different ways in which either transgenics can be produced um, or um, even more uh, possibilities in terms of topical or sprayable applications. You know, and, and I won't read those, read them off to you, but you know, all sorts of uh, uh, sprays or seed treatments or trunk injections, as well as the transgenic modes of deployment. So a lot of different opportunities for innovation and in how one delivers the RNA. And then all of this is underpinned by ongoing research on mechanisms of RNA and, and new insects or, or new uh, pathogens. And Anna's group works on um, how extracellular ves vesicles transport RNA within rootworm. Now, how is it this signal can spread so effectively uh, from being uh, ingested, digested in the, in the gut, and then taken up and moved throughout the insect? And then further research into RNA that is what we call a non-canonical mechanism. So how to show more or less what is the standard way that RNAi is uh, uh, elaborated in eukaryotic cells, but there are many other pathways uh, like peewee RNAs or others uh, that have a different, slightly different mechanism that will most certainly lead to new innovation. So Chris, I think that might be the last slide for me. It is. Um, so Chris, I'm not sure if you come back on at this point. I know we have question and answer coming up. So yeah. From here and, and Absolutely. Uh, Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Anna. That's the presentation portion of today's webinar. We're now going to move on to question and answer session. Uh, we have a variety of folks with us, and uh, first of all, of course, we're keeping Ken and Anna here, and then we have a few uh, panelists, excuse me, two of them, I believe, Bill and Amanda, who have joined us, and why don't Bill and Amanda come on at this time, along with Ken and Anna? Bill, why don't you go first? Amanda, why don't you go second, and each of you introduce yourselves? In the meantime, folks, while they're introducing themselves, uh, why don't you type your questions into Zoom there? We are cataloging them. 
Presenters can see them, and we'll now go through our question and answer period. So, Bill, why don't you kick it off, and then over to you, Amanda. Yeah, so uh, Bill Moore, uh, Bear Crop Science. Uh, I've been working with uh, RNA since, obviously, in the beginning of our SmartStacks Pro product, uh, probably 10 years ago or so. Um, I'm in the group of insect resistance management. So for, when it comes to you know, things that uh, Ken talked about, primarily about resistance concerns, um, that's really what we deal with and it is an integral part of our submission documents to EPA and as a regulatory agencies. And uh, my name is Amanda Pierce. I'm senior advisor in the Emerging Technologies Branch at the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Pesticide Programs. So products like the plant incorporated protectants, like these plants that are producing DSRNA or the sprayable RNA products for pest control, uh, we regulate those. And personally, I'm working on regulatory policy and also focusing heavily on ecological risk assessment for these emerging technologies. All right, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Ken, to moderate now the question and answer period. It looks like they're coming in now and folks just keep asking your questions. We'll get through as many as we can, but we suspect that there will be quite a few. Take it away, Ken. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And I'll try to read these out and, and then direct them to uh, one of the panelists that might be able to, to answer them. Uh, the first one uh, is, as this technique silencing the secondary metabolites in the crop, do you think that it decreases the defense mechanism of crops as secondary metabolites help in the defense mechanism? So you know, I'll answer that a little bit different way, I think, than the way it's, uh, it's asked there, that metabolic engineering, if you want to call it that, uh, can be done based on knowledge of the uh, the biosynthetic pathway. The particular example with glycoalkaloids, you'd have to look at the papers to see how they tweaked um, the, the expression of the to tweak or manipulate the profile of metabolites to confer more pest resistance. More generally, you are correct that if you were to uh, downregulate some of the um, secondary metabolites that are involved in natural host resistance, you would in part of uh, susceptibility to pest, but that's not really the way the, the technology was being applied in that example. Uh, this one I think goes to you, Amanda. Do you also recommend to perform the toxicity testing against the invasive species for the environmental safety? Yeah, so a uh, good question. I think this kind of gets at, you know, ecological risk assessment and how one can approach uh, approach that. So for ecological risk assessment, you know, you have to pick surrogate species because it's just not possible, nor is it practical to test against everything. And when you do that, you're first needing to decide what is it that we're actually concerned about in terms of protecting. So then we're looking at beneficial species, you know, things like pollinators, these types of insects. So with DSRNA, the nice thing here is that it's it can be designed to be so specific that you can really utilize the activity spectrum studies and the bioinformatics to already really hone in on the types of non-target organisms that are most likely to be at risk. And then you can focus that downstream to toxicity testing on sort of confirming those expectations. Yeah, very good. Uh, I see a couple coming up uh, with questions around sprayable. So I'll, I'll try to answer those. The next one is how many applications are required or recommended for the sprayable formulation in crop? Could you please describe about the stability of sprayable formulation? So that's, let's start with the last part of that question first in terms of stability. Uh, looking at environmental stability and degradation is part of uh, what we're doing on, uh, at Greenlight for developing these products. So we're, again, it's a, it's a balance of having degradation in the field that, uh, so you don't build up a bioresidue, uh, but then also, I lost the other part of the question, sorry. Um, but also, sorry, Chris, that question just disappeared off my screen. So I'm missing the- And I can help you. How many applications is recommended? And oh, could you please okay. describe the stability of the sprayable formulation? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Anna. So yeah, the number of uh, applications is gonna depend on the past, how many generations of the past you have per crop, what is the um, residual activity that you have over a, a spray interval? So, you know, most sprays are generally in the seven day range. So you'd like to have a, a residual activity of 
seven days or so, but then not so stable that it uh, causes a bioaccumulation in the environment. Okay, so the next one with success of the sprayable RNA approach, will it be easier going forward to substitute in various pest specific sequences to develop new tools, or does each pest species require more specialized approaches? I would say uh, yes, each pest species is going to require a, a, a specialized approach. I think it will be less common to see simple naked sprayable RNA formulations, uh, as is the case with the potato beetle. More likely, as you try to control a difficult pest, you will be involving some sort of formulation or carrier molecule that will be specialized to the pest of interest. Next question, with the Varroa destruct destructor product have, yeah, have restrictions in terms of removing honey supers withdrawal periods, et cetera. And I'm going to have to take that offline and get back to you. I'll consult with uh, my um, beekeeper experts because some of this uh, is not well known to me. I'm basically a discovery scientist, but we will get back to you, John. Uh, next door, what is known about mechanisms of resistance in target insects? Is the same mechanism responsible for the field resistance in rootworm and lab, CPP? And Bill, I'm going to give that one to you. Sure. Um, so for western corn rootworm, um, what we've known so far is that it's a, a lack of uptake. And in the case of CPP, and we, it looks like it's a we don't know if it's monogenic or not, but we know the resistance is uh, associated with one locus. Um, in the case of CPB, um, certainly it looks like uptake is a piece of it. Uh, this was published by uh, Mishra et al. Uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but theirs looks like it's polygenic, so it looks like there's other mechanisms in place, um, but those have yet to be um, identified. So there is some overlap, but, but not, not total. Okay, thanks, Bill. <clears throat> Lots of questions, so we'll we'll keep uh, keep moving through them. Uh, next question: uh, Where are we currently in the environmental safety assessment of double strand RNA application? Amanda, that'll go to you. And there's a second part, so let's let's answer that first. Uh, okay, so for environmental safety assessment of dsRNA applications, um, we have a general approach that we use for biotechnology. So we've been regulating plant incorporator protectants for the last 30 years. Uh, it's the standard risk assessment framework where you can characterize the hazard and then you characterize the exposure. Uh, risk is ultimately a determination of hazard times exposure. So if you don't have a known hazard, then exposure doesn't necessarily matter, as opposed to if you have a hazard, then you really are characterizing exposure. So with these DSRNA applications, we're able to just use that base risk assessment framework to again, characterize hazard and exposure. For some of the novel applications, like the sprayable DSRNAs, there's potentially additional considerations into the formulation of those products. But as I mentioned, if one is very targeted in terms of the design of their product, then increases in the potential for exposure with increased formulation may not have a large role in environmental safety if there's no known hazard associated with that. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Um, so Anna or Bill, would you like to answer the question, could plant viruses be used for delivery of specific sequence of double-strand RNA, which may work as an alternative to overcome production challenges? Bill or Anna? Want to Take that in terms of feasibility of using a virus launch. Yeah, yeah. So I can answer that again. So yeah, it can definitely we can use definitely use viruses to deliver sequences. Then uh, in terms of regulation, it will be a different type of regulation will be needed to be tested and it will depend on the virus that is carrying that double strand RNA sequence. But in the literature, there is examples where they have used viruses to deliver double strand RNA. And I don't know if Bill has something else to add there. Nope, that's enough. You're fine. Okay, the next question is, how is the progress on stability and cost of production for sprayable double-stranded RNA products? Uh, so I'll take that one really quickly and concisely. Uh, stability, we've got uh, stability in the jug uh, through the use of some um, 
preservatives. And so it's not a, a modification to the RNA, but just um, deters microbial growth. So to your shelf life and the jug. And then in terms of cost of production, I can't give you our exact cost, but we are able to uh, produce double stranded RNA at a uh, at a rate that, or at a cost that will support the business. So let's see, things are bouncing around a little bit here. Next question, is there any research happening in exploring the use of RNAi technology for weed control? What is the prospectus and challenges there? And Bill, I'm gonna give that to you since Monsanto had a program in BioDirect for that purpose. Bill, can you, can you take that? You're on mute, sorry. I couldn't get off mute, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So I think there's several considerations, um, whether you're going after a target for, for weeds or our interest is really more going after um, resistant weeds. And if you're going, if you're going to target resistance weeds and using RNAi, what you're really talking about is, is down-regulating a resistance mechanism. So if the resistance is due to upregulation of a, of a gene, then you can downregulate it with, with RNAi or double-stranded RNA. The problem is that many of these plants have multiple mechanisms of resistance. So just downregulating one mechanism may not confer a susceptibility. Okay, thanks. Amanda, this next one for you, ESA, and I'm assuming that means environmental safety assessment, is an evolving process that is causing challenges in the regulation of conventional chemicals. Do you see the ESA being streamlined for RNA-based pesticides on the targeted activity, or will it remain to be seen? Yes, great question. And I, in this case, I actually I assume ESA is referencing an Endangered Species Act. Oh, Not going to get out of that <laughs> question. But yeah, that's a fantastic question. And um, you know the, the question is spot on in this specific nature of these DSRNA products lend themselves towards being able to make no effect findings under the Endangered Species Act. So for example, Calantha, which was just registered, Green Lights product, that has a nationwide no effect finding uh, for its use on potatoes because there was a reasonable expectation that it would not result in any discernible effects to any listed species. Very good. Mm. Next question is how do sprayable RNAi compare to conventional crop protection chemicals for environmental safety? Right back to you. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the fact that I just told you we were able to make a nationwide no effect finding for Calantha for endangered species also lends itself to that environmental safety for these types of products. So they're very specific. And so if they're designed properly, you can have a product that has uh, no expectation for effects to non-target organisms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna, I'm going to give this one to you. Given our experience with transgenic crops, how best can we communicate with the public about risk of RNAi technologies? I think the main part is first explaining how it works. A big uh, scare from the public about RNAi technologies is that uh, a lot of people is just scared of the word RNAi or DNA. This was before COVID, but in Nebraska, they did a survey where they asked the public uh, how, if they if it's okay for you or it's healthy for you to eat DNA, 60% of the people that answer say no. So that's kind of like where we're starting. So a big part is just talking about what it is, how it works, it's a mechanism that we have. We have building mechanisms. In our or in our bodies and other organisms have the same mechanisms to deal with it, uh, and then using maybe this publication and the information that is provided to share with the public. But I think the first thing is just explain how the technology works, and that will help people understand better uh, what are the potential risks. Okay, thank you, uh, Amanda. A couple more coming to you on on regulatory. First one is how long on average does it take to get approval in the United States for the PIPs? Follow that with how synchronous are regulatory pathways across the world for RNA high products? Well, so, okay, how long does it take to get a regulatory approval in the US for PIPs? There's the answer if you look at the PREA category, and then I would say at this point in time, it's taking um, a 
couple of years to get regulatory approval for a PIP, given the extensive uh, evaluations that we're performing. In terms of synchronous regulatory pathways across the world for RNAi products, so I'm sure developers are aware different countries have quite different regulatory systems, but there is uh, real efforts being made to try to have as synchronous pathways as is possible. So the US EPA, for example, is involved in a few different OECD working groups where we're working with regulators across the world to develop uh, considerations for the human health and the environmental risk assessment for these types of products. Okay. Uh, Bill, another question on, on resistance. Can you comment on resistance development for an RNAi-based technology? What mechanism could be or have been observed? Yeah, so we answered that somewhat before where it looks like it's primarily uptake um, from the insect. And um, like I said, for CPB, it looks like it's, it's, it's polygenic. And so there's probably other mechanisms at play. Um, I think also too is, you know, what, what we did with uh, SmartStacks Pro is, you know, we, we went out with the, the individual trait, the DDSNF7 DSRNA, and we started in the light in the field and then we went into the lab to, to increase selection. And so, you know, it's, we, we certainly come up with these type of mechanisms. As far as the development in the field, there's other things at play. Um, also too, Kim, you know, you showed where we're stacking these with, uh, with other MOAs, um, which should increase the durability. Good, thank you, Bill. Uh, so I'll take the next one. Oops, jumped off my screen, there it is. Is it necessary to identify a gene or group of genes that are unique to an insect species in order to target the genes for silencing using double-stranded RNA sprays in a field environment? So as I mentioned, uh, really what you do is look for sequence specificity. Now that the protein that's encoded may be similar in other, other organisms, but your control mechanism is at the level of the messenger RNA sequence. So if you design for specificity, then you should target only the intended um, species of interest. Okay, the next one, I think it's a public perception type or education question, a little long, and I'm gonna read it and you can parse out how to answer it. Analyzing the ethical implications and regulatory challenges surrounding, surrounding the widespread adoption of RNA interference in agriculture. Consider factors such as public perception, environmental impact assessments, and international regulatory frameworks. How can these challenges be navigated to ensure responsible and sustainable deployment of RNA technology and crop improvement? It's a lot in that one. That's a lot in that one, and it's too bad that Roma wasn't able to join us for this one. She would be great. I think a big part is just talking about it. Uh, people attending this seminar, sharing with other uh, people. And international regulatory frameworks, uh, as explained last week during our live uh, release of the event, might take a little bit longer, but its variables are uh, being viewed in different than uh, uh, incorporated or transgenic approaches. Um, in terms of environmental impact, I think Amanda has answered some of that. And then how this can be na navigated, I think it's currently being navigated as good as we can and as fast as we can. And knowing that it's a new technology and it takes time to develop those regulatory frameworks uh, for risk assessment, both for humans and for the environment. I don't know if maybe Amanda or Bill has something else to add there. Yeah, there's several, there's several components there, I think. We've touched on many of them already in terms of perception and harmonization of regulatory and uh, environmental impact assessments. So uh, I think we'll we'll move on from that one. Uh, the next one is more or less specific to Colorado potato beetle. It's notorious for its insecticides resistance development. Have any lab cultures of CPB been selected that demonstrate resistance to RNAi? Um, the answer to that is yes. Bill talked about it. Uh, Juan Luis Jura Fuentes in his lab selected for some and they published on that. So please look at that for more details. What resistance management strategies will be employed with the use of sprayable RNAi formulations? Uh, in the case of potato beetle, it'll be um, an IPM approach rotating with other modes of action. And then the last part, are GM potatoes expressing RNA in development? 
Um, I'm not aware that there are any in development now, but Monsanto in the early days actually had a product for a genetically modified potato, not RNA, but for a, a protein. I think you call that new leaf, Bill. Um, but at the moment, uh, I'm not aware of any RNAi transgenics. I, I think uh, the Arctic apple is, it's not for insect control, but it is for, for other, right. that other would characteristics. Be, you're right, that's that's a good point. There is, a, yeah, a, a, an enhanced um, shelf life type apple that is expressing double strand RNA, so correct. Related to Calantha, did US EPA grant tolerance exemption for this product or MRL was established? Amanda? Uh, yes, so for Calantha, EPA did grant a tolerance exemption for the active ingredient in that product. So we were able to uh, look at data that indicated that the dsRNA in Calantha degraded in the same rate as RNA from plants and other types of naked RNA. And there's a long history of uh, safe dietary exposure to consuming RNA from plants. So for that reason, we were able to rely on this history of safe use and grant a tolerance exemption. Okay, thank you. Um, next question probably is directed to me, but better directed to our formulations team uh, is CPAC accelerated storage test 54 degrees for two weeks, the right test for stability analysis of double-stranded RNA-based biopesticides. Um, that uh, accelerated uh, stability test is one of a panel of uh, stability tests that we do. So I guess the answer is yes. Uh, we do use that in characterizing our product. Uh, ESA is Endangered Species Act. Thank you. I did. I guessed wrongly. Amanda deciphered it though. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Next one. I'm familiar with RNAi and viral production using CRISPR-Cas in mammalian systems. This is interesting to see your work in plants. I'm curious to know if the recording of this webinar will be available to go through later. Chris, can you answer that? Yes, indeed. The recording will be made available. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second with regards to the paper as well. So. Okay. All right, thanks. And that gave me a, a pause to look at the clock. We have three minutes. So we'll see how many more of these we can get through. And thanks everybody for submitting really great questions. Uh, so I think inspires some insights and, and some thought. Next question, once these RNA enter the insect, what happens in birds or mammals that eat these infected animals? Uh, what happened? Sorry, my, my screen changed. Are there going to be unintended consequences throughout the food chain? Uh, Amanda, can you comment based yep. on requirements? Yeah, no problem. So, you know, there's a few steps that have to happen for the dsRNA to sort of elicit any effect in a non-target organism. So in this case, uh, let's say the Colorado potato beetle eats the dsRNA. It's likely to then be processed inside of that pest species, and it's not expected to bioaccumulate. So it wouldn't really have any meaningful levels by the time some other organism eats it. But let's assume that it did. In birds and animals, they have all of these physiological barriers to uptake. So it's not even likely that the dsRNA or the siRNAs are going to get to any molecular target in those non-target organisms. And when you have a product that is very specific, if there are no sequence matches in the transcriptomes of these other organisms, it's not going to elicit any sort of an effect. So again, that's a focusing on the design specificity side of things, in addition to many other biological factors, about how these types of products can be so specific that we're able to make findings that there's not going to be any effects on non-target organisms in the environment. So Ken, I'd like to, to add there, um, this is sort of the same question that came up with BTs for many, many years, is that when the when the target insect eats, eats BT or eats RNA and actually has an effect, it's probably not going to be optimal food, right? It's going to be sick or it's not growing, whatever. And from that standpoint, uh, oftentimes the the next trophic level may not perform as well because it's not e it's eating suboptimal food. So it's not a direct impact from the from the dsRNA or the BT, but you could you would still see an impact, but it's not because of the the talk the the insecticide itself. Okay. 
Thanks. And uh, Chris, I'm going to bring you on because we probably are down within our last 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's good. Thank you for filling the time, folks, with a lot of great questions. Um, just a note, there was a question about the slides. Yes, they will be made available. The recording will be made available. The paper is available on your screen right now. You have a QR code to download it. Simply scan it and go see the paper. So we make all of our resources free a little bit, freely available to everyone. And that comes, of course, through the generous support of our supporting organizations. So moving on here to just a few final slides. We do have some upcoming webinars here at CAS. We have uh, a number coming up related to FIFRA and ESA. So if you're interested in this webinar series, you can see the upcoming topics. Please join us on January 30 for the next February 20 and March 12, where we tackle this complex topic in the regulatory space. So please join us for that. Lastly, as I said, we are supported through uh, the membership, not only of the supporting organizations, but also our individual members. If you're interested in becoming a cast member at the individual level or at the organizational level, do please reach out. We'd love to chat with you. You can see our contact information on the screen at this time. And my one final request, and this is a big one, if you could follow us on social media, it'd be great because you will learn about our upcoming paper rollouts as they move around the country. You'll hear about our webinars. Um, you'll hear about our other activities and things that you could be part of. So do please um, follow us on social media. We greatly appreciate it. With that, I want to thank you, Ken and Anna, for leading this overall effort as the chairs. Thank you to Bill, Amanda, and though they're not here, the rest of our panelists who were present with us in North Carolina, and of course, the long list of individuals that were involved in the paper at large. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors, Greenlight Biosciences, Syngenta, BASF, and our generous hosts, at North Carolina State University last week, and then who, of course, supported us this week, too. So thank you, everyone. I wish everyone a great day, and uh, stay warm if you're in a cold climate. Take care. Bye-bye.